Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I'm very proud to be the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, and chairing uh, this oversight hearing on percent for art and public art in New York City. Uh, we are joined by committee member and uh, council member Joe Borelli from Staten Island uh, to my left. And uh, I am uh, certainly expecting more uh, members uh, to be joining us uh, this morning. I want to thank Commissioner Finkelperl for uh, being here. We, um, uh, at the last hearing, believed that might be his last public hearing, um, but uh, lo and behold, we have uh, uh, brought him back one last time, and uh, so all of those laudatory comments that we made at the last hearing, uh, we're just gonna stipulate again, uh, continue, uh, but I do wanna say uh, thank you to the commissioner for his uh, public service uh, to the city of New York, which I know will continue in one way or another, and uh, all of uh, what he has done for uh, culture and art, not just in this position, uh, but also his tenure at the Queens Museum and MoMA PS1, and of course, uh, uh, his work as an artist and author and thinker on all things uh, culture and the arts. So with that, we will uh, talk a little bit about why we're here. Um, Public art is an essential part of cultural expression in New York City and vitally important for enriching our communities and public spaces. The Present for Art program is one of the most important programs fostering the creation and acquisition of public art in the city. The Present for Art law requires that 1% of the budget for eligible city-funded construction projects be, sent, be spent on public artwork. And we've increased and uh, made a bit larger the Percent for Art program over the last few years here at the City Council. Since the program's inception, uh, several hundred projects have been completed uh, with more than 70 artist commissions currently in progress. Uh, of the commissioned artists to date, an estimated 43% are women, 34% are artists of color. In 2017, the council passed three laws that made changes to the Percent for Art program. Uh, we increased the budget for Percent for Arts projects, uh, required that advisory panels recommend works of art for inclusion, and required DCLA to publish information about Percent for Art projects uh, and make them more transparent. DCLA uh, also coordinates public artists in residence, the PAIR program, and uh, the City Canvas program, a new pilot program, which permits selected cultural organizations to install visual art on sidewalk sheds and constru construction fences. Um, and our city parks are home to over 1,000 public monuments. The Department of Parks and Recreation has said that the monuments and permanent art collection in New York City's parks may constitute the greatest outdoor public art museum in the US. But we all know and understand that that art and that particular public art museum does not adequately represent the city that we currently live in and there are historic inequities uh, in uh, just who is represented in our public monuments throughout the city of New York. Uh, so there are a number of other uh, programs, uh, Department of Transportation's DOT art program, which works with community-based organizations, local artists, to present temporary artwork on DOT property, uh, the New York City Mural Arts Project, and uh, so many others. Lastly, we've all heard and read much about public monuments and the She Built uh, program, and we're also here to learn a little bit more about that process, uh, and in particular, the decision-making process. Certainly, the uh, Mother Cabrini issue uh, uh, dominated a lot of uh, uh, the conversation 
uh, and certainly I will ask about that, but uh, there are certainly many other elements to be discussed as part of that. Uh, but most of all, I want to, um, certainly as the commissioner uh, leaves his current position and we await a new uh, cultural affairs commissioner, uh, want to know from this administration uh, just how committed they are and the city is to increasing public art, uh, to making sure that there are more monuments, that they are more diverse, and that we do it in a way that involves the community, that listens to community, that respects community, uh, and that all of that will reflect the diversity of our great city. Uh, so I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl for being here, all of you for being here, those who've signed up to testify. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, our committee's finance analyst, Alia Ali, our legislative policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Nell Beekman. Uh, with that, we will uh, start by swearing in Commissioner Finkelpearl and welcome him to deliver his testimony. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. I'm here today to testify in regards to today's topic, Percent for Art and Public Art in New York. This is a subject that I am, is very close to my heart and something I've dedicated my professional life to. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak about it on the record as I approach the end of my tenure as commissioner. I'll begin with a bit of history of the program. Mayor Ed Koch signed New York City's Percent for Art uh, Law into law in 1982. The first American Percent for Art program was set up in Philadelphia in 1959, with dozens more following across the country. Its early proponents saw Percent as a way to integrate public artwork into the country's urban fabric, which had begun to fray in the post-war era. Percent for Art, the Percent for Art movement was a quiet revolution in our country's relationship to public art. Slowly but surely, public art came to be seen as a widely embraced public good. The late 19th and early 20th centuries saw major growth in the number of statues and monuments, from the Statue of Liberty to countless figures on horseback and war memorials installed across the country. Percent brought a radically different approach, using public funds to commission professional artists for site-specific, permanent public artwork. The formula for how to commission these publicly funded projects evolved to balance arts and design professionals with city officials and community representatives. The results speak for themselves. There are more than 350 Percent for Art programs across the United States. The number of Percent for Art commissions completed here in New York City is approaching 400. Nearly as many artists working across media have been commissioned from mosaics to sculpture to an LED chandelier that slices and dices phrases from the plays of William Shakespeare. A recent audit of the, uh, by the Public Design Commission revealed some illuminating facts about our city's collection of outdoor artwork. It examined pieces installed from 1830 through the present day. In New York City's public statuary, not a single black person was depicted from the period of 1830 to 1970. Of the first 65 monuments built in New York over those years, every last one was a man of European descent. Just imagine, as the Harlem Renaissance pushed American art and culture forward, not a single person of color was celebrated among the city's dozens of monuments. As women were increasingly represented in public office and leadership roles in our society, hardly any were recognized for their achievements. And until the 1970s, 90 to 95% of monuments were created by white men. In a city that draws strength from its inclusive, diverse population, this is an, uh, an appalling disconnect. The great diversity of our city and its people only began to be represented in new public artwork commissioned in the 1970s. The rate increased drastically over the course of the 80s and the 90s. This can largely be credited to the program we are here to discuss today and the shift in public attitudes and practices that it helped foster. According to the Public Design uh, Commission's inventory, the percentage of women and artists of color Created in our, uh, creating our public artworks has grown from 15% in the 60s to over 40% in the 80s to 75% in recent years. This is an incredible leap forward 
When the public art process shifted from privately driven campaigns with fundraising efforts and wealthy benefactors to a professional panel review process, both the artists commissioned and the work created made a great leap into more diverse, engaging, and representative public artworks. In the 34 years since the first Percent for Art Commission was installed in East Harlem, hundreds of schools, parks, plazas, libraries, courthouses, and other civic spaces have had permanent artwork installed. New York City's built environment is immeasurably richer for it. Even with the, ex so now to some contemporary issues and, and reform, even with the extraordinary legacy a Percent for Art has created, we are grateful to have partners in the City Council who are committed to working with us to make program even better. Percent's commissioning process balances community input, arts professionals, historians, and a range of other voices to inform and shape the design of an artwork. Another key goal of the process is championing an artist's vision and avoiding artwork that is designed by committee. It is essential to maintain this balance while fostering an environment of mutual respect among people who may have different views. In 2015, Mayor de Blasio signed legislation sponsored by Chair Van Bramer that expanded and formalized the public notice for works of art. Our Percent for Art team has presented to dozens of community meetings since then as a very first step in commissioning process. In 2017, the mayor signed another suite of reforms sponsored again by Chair Van Bramer and Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. This legislation increased the amount of city um, Amount, the amount that the City of New York can spend on public art, revising the Percent for Art formula for the first time in the program's history. More funding for public art commissions means higher quality, more ambitious, and, very importantly for artworks installed outdoors, more durable artwork. Other bills in this package formalize the makeup of the Percent for Art panels and further expanded requirements for public engagement. For each new commission, this is a balance we have to strike carefully, based on the specific content of a given artwork. And as many in this room are well aware, even using the word community in the, singular, in the singular can risk minimizing the differences of viewpoints characterized by a group of passionate New Yorkers. There are always multiple communities involved, not to mention individual actors. No process will ever be perfect, but striving for this balance has created a public art program that has a remarkable track record of success and creates buy-in and consensus among participants. We value the Council's part, uh, partnership in every percent project and appreciate your role as stakeholders, advocates, partners who are willing to have a constructive dialogue about how to improve the program. The reforms and progress achieved in this legislation are a testament to the collaborative spirit you have fostered. Let me talk for a moment about the Monuments Commission. I've been working in New York's public art community for most of my adult life. I ran the Percent for Art program from 1990 to 96, so I believe I have a good perspective uh, to say that there has never been a brighter spotlight on the issues of who we honor in our public monuments. Nationally, this could be seen in the clashes around Confederate monuments through the southern United States. He in New York City, Mayor de Blasio established the Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers to examine how these issues were playing out here and to invite, public weigh in, to invite the public to weigh in. The Monuments Commission's charge was to review controversial items in the city-owned property. As DCLA's commissioner, I served as co-chair of the Monuments Commission alongside Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation. We hosted public hearings in all five boroughs to listen to what New Yorkers had to say about the representation, about representation of the city's public art collection. More than 500 individuals attended these hearings, nearly 200 testified, and an online survey referred, uh, received more than 3,000 responses. The commission considered several pieces of art on city property that were subject of sustained controversy and worked to formulate recommendations for addressing these in a considered inclusive way. The Monuments Commission issued its final report in January of 2018. In addition to proposals on several artworks, uh, works of art in the city's collection, the report's most far-reaching recommendation was to take an additive approach, commissioning new works to expand the voices and histories represented in the city's art collection. The mayor embraced this recommendation and allocated $10 million as a down payment on this long-term effort. A number of new initiatives to make New York's uh, public spaces more inclusive, welcoming, and representative of our shared values grew from the Monuments Commission. While we started a more expansive audit of the city's art collection with the Public Design Commission, one area of representation was glaringly obvious. Of the nearly 150 figurative statues on city-owned parkland, just four depicted historical women. 
So with the Mayor's Office and Women.NYC, we created She Built NYC to commission new artwork honoring women who have been unfairly excluded from this form of public commemoration. We began with an open call for nominations, which yielded hundreds of extraordinary candidates. An expert panel then reviewed the public nominations and issued recommendations for future monuments. We've since announced monuments honoring seven incredible figures, all of them pulled from the public nominations. In May of this year, I joined the Mayor and the First Lady to announce that the city would commission a monument to the pioneering LGBTQ activists, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera in Greenwich Village. This was the She Built NYC's panel's talk top recommendation. Shirley Chisholm was the first honoree announced in November 2018, and in March of this year, the city announced that Billie Holiday, Helen Rodriguez Trias, Elizabeth Jennings Graham, and Catherine Rocker would be the next to be honored, bringing new public artwork to, uh, bringing new public artwork to all five boroughs. As these pieces are completed in the years ahead, we will more than double the number of historical women recognized in our public collection. This will help to address the inequity that has been generations in the making, which we've moved quickly and aggressively to address through this far-reaching initiative. In a much, another mayor, major outcome of the Monuments Commission, Mayor de Blasio ordered the removal of the statue honoring J. Marion Sims, located at the edge of Central Park across from the New York Academy of Medicine. Sims unethically performed medical experiments on enslaved black women and this statue was the focus of sustained community opposition in East Harlem for years. The statue's removal in April 2018 marked the beginning of our efforts called Beyond Sims to work with local community to commission new artwork for the site. We co-hosted in-depth community discussion to keep residents engaged in the art commissioning process and to articulate what the community wants to achieve through this new artwork. From the very start, we recognized that this commission was different from most and that the level of community participation needed to reflect this painful history, the local activism, and the incredible enthusiasm for its Sims removal and the creation of the new artwork. As a result, we worked with local residents and other stakeholders on one of the most comprehensive public engagement processes in the history of the Percent Program. We started working with local stakeholders on the new commission immediately following the removal of Sims in April 2018 in October, we announced, uh, was announced the formal creation of the Committee to Empower Voices for Healing and Equity. The committee consists of East Harlem residents, advocacy groups, cultural organizations, city council and community board representatives, and city agencies. We've worked with the committee for a full year, hosting participating in 19 public meetings over that period. Through this intense engagement process, four artist finalists were chosen at the initial artist selection panel hosted at the Schomburg Center in February. Still, as many of you are aware, the final artist selection panel held in October sparked intense debate. After the present for our, uh, panel voted in favor of artist Simone Lee's proposal, Lee decided to withdraw in recognition of the community's preference for artist Vinnie Bagwell's proposal called Victory Beyond Sims. We will work with Bagwell to bring her vision for this site to life, and the present for Art team will continue to involve community as the design process moves forward. We took a hard look at how Percent for Art process, which has so many successful, which is so many success, uh, had so many successful uh, experiences in the vast majority of public art commissions, ran into trouble with Beyond Sims project. One reform we've made is adding an additional panel meeting to all commissions of new uh, monuments or other sensitive projects. We believe that this way, the community stakeholders and the panelists charged with selecting an artist will have more time to meet and familiarize themselves with the site, the history, the present for art process. Understanding the process and everyone's role in it can go a long way into creating a sense of collaboration and buy-in. And we think the additional meeting will help foster this essential component. For Beyond Sims, we follow the standard makeup of the selection panel used by percent, but in hindsight, additional opportunities for the panelists and the community to interact could have helped establish a greater mutual understanding. <coughs> Excuse me. We believe that this additional meeting between panelists and stakeholders will provide, uh, will improve this relationship. This year, the Public Design Commission also made input from a historian a requirement for monuments and memorials, a practice we've employed through percent for our panels, but which we're glad to see consistently applied citywide. <clears throat> we are open to considering additional ideas for how to improve the process, particularly for monuments and memorials. Controversy has always come with the territory of public art and design. Michelangelo's David was pelted with rocks when it was being installed for its perceived political messaging. 
The Eiffel Tower was loathed by many 19th century Parisians. Closer in time to us in space, Myelin had to struggle against charges of elitism when creating the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. In the decades since it was installed, it has become a clear, um, it has become clear that its powerful memorial ushered in a new era in public monuments. Just last month, the city announced that a privately funded monument honoring the Lyons family will be built in Central Park. This extraordinary black family fought, against, fought for justice, equality, and humanity in the face of despicable racism in the 19th and 20th century. As the PDC audit made clear, our overall public art collection needs to see major new advances to break out of the narrow vision of New York City that it currently depicts. But we believe that the progress we've made together has set the city on a new path. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on such an important issue. I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for your testimony and for uh, addressing all of the um, issues that have received a lot of attention over the last uh, few months, to say the least. Um, uh, because you, you spoke so much about it, I want to, I suppose, start with the Monuments Commission and the, uh, uh, and She Built NYC. Okay. And, you know, I think what folks want is a little more transparency around that process, but in particular, the decision-making process, because when you have an open call for submissions, uh, some folks might have understood that to be a, uh, uh, a vote of some kind. Uh, and, and we all know that uh, uh, Mother Cabrini um, uh, received uh, a significant number of uh, submissions and nominations, um, but was not ultimately chosen. And maybe you can walk us through that process and who ultimately is the final decision maker there? Um, and, and was it you uh, as the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs? Uh, and if not, who was it? Um, okay, so let me, let me take one step back and then I would promise to answer your question. So the, there are a couple of different times in this whole process where we've solicited uh, ideas essentially from the public. And another example was during the Monuments Commission, we had an open portal and we asked for uh, lots of comments, over 3,000 people made comments um, about the monuments, uh, but it was clearly not perceived as a vote. Nobody says there was a vote uh, in, you know, in the monuments uh, and why didn't you follow the vote? It was just very well understood as input. So. The second time we solicited public input, and again, there were lots of public meetings and public hearings, et cetera, but this online portal that you're referring to, which was a nominations portal, we asked for nominations of She Built. It was uh, announced, we're gonna you know, commission. We have a, a, a money to commission uh, monuments to women. So the, the nominations came in, then there was a process, which was an interagency process between cultural affairs, um, city hall, and parks, also to look around for sites. We wanted to find a, um, a monument for each borough, um, this being a, a citywide uh, uh, initiative. And that list then, would found, which uh, created uh, that list of five people that I referred to, uh, was brought to, um, the First Lady and Deputy Mayor Glenn for the final approval. So again, it wasn't something where they were like, they were choosing off of a list. It was a big interagency process of evaluating. The other thing it's very important to, to say is that this was not a final, you know, final, final. There's going to be a second round. And as the mayor said, um, Mother Cabrini, who's an amazing person, I want to also say that publicly. I've said that before. What an incredible woman. There were lots of incredible women on the list. And it was very, you know, possible that that could be uh, part of the second round of, uh, of She Built. Um, so that process is about to happen. We're going to go back and find more people from the list uh, to commission. So that, that was the process that happened, an interagency process that took into account. And then, by the way, let me also repeat that there was an out expert outside panel that made recommendations. The number one record, the, their top recommendation was uh, or will be commissioned, which is Marcia P. Johnson and Silver Rivera. So we had the outside panel. 
Uh, and then we had the uh, interagency city decision making process. Sure. So just to uh, put a finer point on this, uh, you were not uh, the final decision maker on who would be uh, honored in this way. Yes, that's correct. And again, you know, women.nyc was very involved in this. Um, but the final decision rested with First Lady Shirlene McRae and Deputy Mayor Alicia. They Gatton. approved the list, that's correct. Right. So, um, uh, and of course, as it turns out, Mother uh, Cabrini will be honored. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, in, in Battery Park, and I think everybody's very happy about that. And again, an incredible person. We're so glad that the state you know, took, right. the, took up the mantle of something we'd started, right. found a great site for it. There's a commission going on, so congratulations. I'm really happy that that's happening. I think maybe, maybe people underestimated how many people read the tablet, um, uh, particularly in uh, Queens and Brooklyn. Um, uh, but uh, I think as you prepare to, to leave this particular role, are there recommendations that you would make to your successor and to the mayor's office and obviously the first lady and uh, the deputy mayor that the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs reports to yes. um, about how future uh, decisions can be reached at in a more transparent way that um, create less confusion about just who's in charge here, right? Because I think a lot of people uh, think that you are mm -hmm. uh, because you're the Department of Cultural Affairs Commissioner. Right. Um, and uh, you are appointed by the mayor who is duly elected by the people of the city of New York. Um, but obviously, when it comes to the uh, public monuments and she built NYC, um, there are other significant players here. And, uh, and in some cases, those folks are actually making the final decisions and, and not yourself. Obviously, you have input. As you know, I respect greatly uh, your uh, tenure here at the Par Department of Cultural Affairs. But are there ways in which this could be done better to avoid some of the controversy, particularly since the commissioner is not the final decision maker and the final arbiter, but often you get the blowback mm -hmm. because you're in this role and people think, well, Tom made that decision, but you didn't, right? Well, I mean, I will say just that the decision-making process that I engage in all the time is something where you know stuff happens at the agency. We all talk it over, and often, and almost always, I will, if it's a major decision, bring it up to the deputy mayor, and sometimes to the mayor for you know this for other for major initiatives. Uh, that kind of what I've just described, in other words, a bunch of city agencies getting together and then going to the deputy mayor. That's a very normal way that I operate. I will say that the, the you asked, do I have recommendations? And the recommendations that that I put in my testimony are, are already. So I really think that having an extra panel meeting, that we've talked this over, so everybody sits together, understands, everybody's on the same page, uh, I think is going to be helpful. I also just don't think that there is any way, per se, to avoid controversy in public art. And we have experienced this in your borough, I mean your borough, <laughs> your borough, your district, um, in the- That's a great in, Freudian slip. <laughs> There you go. I'm but um, ahead. But the um, no. But you, you, of course, you know. So that was a, a, a piece of very light-hearted uh, public art, which I think, in the long run, is popular. I believe to be. I see it all over Instagram, etc. Uh, which even that kind of thing can flip. Sure. So I'm just saying, in the in the intensity of the environment that we're in right now, in relationship to monuments. Stuff like this is happening in lots of places across the country, and I think it's very important to put things in place to, to make it as uh, clear and transparent as possible. I will certainly recommend that to my successor. Um, but again, it's part of what's happening in America right now around, and things are inflamed in general around mine specifically. So you and I, I think we did some good work around uh uh, that particular uh, controversial piece, uh, Public Art in Long Island City, 
Um, and I, as you know, have said publicly in the New York Times and other places that uh, uh, there is no perfect process. We will never get to a place where everyone agrees uh, in, in subjecting public art to uh, 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 a public vote and, and you know, public uh, taste is a very uh, 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 dangerous road to go down. But. But, and this is why I think it's just important that whoever is the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, is in a place where there's clear transparency just about how the decisions are made, in particular because these are controversial things by their very nature. And I just wanted to be clear to the people of the city of New York um, who's making those decisions because it's fundamentally unfair for, let's say, the Department of uh, cultural affairs commissioner uh, to be blamed for decisions that they didn't in fact make. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, publicly. I have other questions, but I know that Councilmember Borelli also uh, would like to, so I want to give him an opportunity and then I will uh, ask some follow-up questions as well. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I just uh, want to say thank you for uh, s your service over the past five years. Um, I, I have always enjoyed uh, your, your frankness in addressing uh, the, the concerns of some of the institutions in my district uh, and appreciate the, the moments when you personally weighed in to help those. I, I have one question, and it's it, only because you referenced the Statue of Liberty and, and we're having almost like an exit interview now, and <laughs> I, I'm really interested in your opinion of this. Um, you referenced the Statue of Liberty. After five years in, in what is considered the highest echelon of, of public art um, governance in New York City, do you think, given the, um, the controversy, the opposition, the environmental regulations, the acquisitions, the, the approvals from uh, buildings and uh, the City Planning Commission, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do you think it would be possible for New York City in 2019 to build something as grand as the Statue of Liberty? Wow, that's a very deep question. It is, it is. Yeah. That was the point. Yeah, <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, look, I think that the, um, the initiative that's going on right now, not as an individual monument, but collectively, is on that scale of ambition. So if you think of $10 million being set aside, plus let's say the Lions Monument, which is the first privately mon uh, commissioned monument uh, announced recently, that's a big initiative. And, and again, look, uh, there's a lot of time to make up. There are you know, 145 uh, monuments to men and only four to women in parks. I think it's a multi-generational initiative, but I think that the initiative uh, to tackle history in a new way is on that scale. I wouldn't say that we have any individual monument, obviously, planned on the scale of the Statue of Liberty. Um, so I mean, think that that would be my answer, but I think that the uh, question of whether we could put something, all of our eggs in one basket in a way as a city uh, is a very excellent question to ponder. Well, thank you. I, and I would submit my, myself as a model for, for uh, said statue in the future. <laughs> so right. thank you, and uh, I wish you good luck. Thank you, Councilman. So I, I love Councilmember Borelli, but please do not erect a statue <laughs> of Councilmember Borelli. The statue of Borelli. That'll be privately funded on <laughs> Staten Island one day. But, um, uh, but I want to uh, follow up actually on, yeah. on Councilmember Borelli's question and, and your response, because uh, it is true we don't have anything of that incredible uh, grand scale going on. But, you know, we saw you know, what I think is this, you know, hideous monstrosity called the vessel built in Hudson Yards. And, and that is a, a significantly privately funded uh, uh, work of, I guess, public art that you might call it that if you were generous. And, but it, it, it points to something that I think you care a lot about too, which is, you know, grand, grand expressions like that shouldn't just be reserved for the billionaires um, and, and millionaire class, right? Um, so how do we get to a, a place where we're once again thinking maybe on more grand scales uh, for public art that's, that's publicly funded and that's actually for real yeah. people? So I mean, I, I, there is one example of that going up in New York City next year. 
which is by uh, uh, David Hammonds. It's across the street from the Whitney Museum on the water side, which is largely publicly funded, but there is council money and administration money in that. Uh, I believe it's a $19 million project. It's larger than the Whitney Museum itself. It is on the scale. I wonder if it's bigger. I wonder if you could fit the Statue of Liberty inside it. I'm not sure of that. <laughs> but there is, that's a grand piece of public art. It's a public-private partnership. It was uh, created you know, from a curatorial vision of the Whitney Museum, I will admit. But I think with lots of good uh, groundwork done in the community, I feel like it's embraced the history of that site, the LGBTQ history, the labor history. Uh, to have a senior artist of his repute, I believe it'll be the largest piece of public art erected by an African-American artist ever in America. That's a scale, that's an ambition. Again, it's a public-private thing. It's not like the vessel, which essentially was decided by one, as I understand it, one person, a developer, very private, 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 billionaire-ish initiative. Um, but also very, very popular itself. I don't wanna you know, shed too much shade on that. But uh, the vision of the David Hammonds piece across from the Windy, I, it, I think is a wonderful legacy of public art. So it is possible to do things on grand scale still. Um, I think he's a billionaire, not billionaire-ish. Right? <laughs> okay. He's extremely wealthy. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, no, look, I'm a huge supporter of that project, uh, as you know. Yes. Uh, um, and look forward to that incredible piece. Um, so let's turn to uh, the uh, the Sims uh, process and uh, what you think can be changed there uh, to make it better. So the uh, I made a note when you were testifying, right, there's the standard makeup of the panel and, yep. and of course this was consistent with, yep. with the current standard, um, mm -hmm. but should should we now take this opportunity to change what is now the standard makeup of the panels and uh, make them more truly representative and uh, and amplify the voice of local communities? Do you support that? Do you think the next commissioner in this administration should uh, take this opportunity to change the standard makeup of the panels? So look, I mean, what I believe happened, and there's a lot of people in this room who were in the room with us when a lot of this unfolded, was that the, there was, um, getting to the four finalists was, there was sort of this belief that, that all four finalists in a way were completely embraced, uh, which actually on the last day turned out not to be the case. And embraced by the community, or communities. Uh, and there were a lot of people in the room had been there, a lot of the people in the room had been this very same people who fought valiantly and successfully to take down a piece of what was deemed to be racist public art. And you know, I, and again, they're here, and I, I do wanna recognize the incredible work that went into that. That was very, very important for the city. One of the best <coughs> moving moments of my time as commissioner was to be there that morning, a cold, early morning where everybody showed up to see Sims taken down. That then, the feeling about that site and the legitimate sort of feeling of ownership of that site was, was very intense. So I, again, I'm, what I think, what I'm recommending is in my testimony. What I think it could be done is if we had all been in the same room with the panel, with the expert panel, for a few series of three meetings, to really get to know what's going on, to understand fully and emotionally and intellectually the history of that site, and I'm not just talking about the history of Sims, but the history of the activists in the community, I feel that that would go a long way towards uh, getting people on the same page. So I'm not, I'm not gonna recommend any other changes than what I've already said in my testimony. Um, I think that, again, it's also a very small sample size, right, that, that if you think of the 400, nearly 400 commissions, the vast majority of those, including other monuments, uh, have gone well. So I'm not recommending any other changes than what I've already uh, proposed in the testimony, which again is not my recommendation. It's collectively decided and discussed throughout my staff and city government. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I, I appreciate what, what uh, you've said. Um, 
and I realize that um, the experience that that you all have had with uh, with the Sims process and the Beyond Sims project uh, is is one of many that you've encountered, and you may um, and and have had many other good experiences or better experiences or different experiences, but. Um, I'm still a little surprised that after all of this, because whatever process we've got, you know, I'm sure that we can improve it and we can always create more transparency. We can always create uh, more community involvement. And, um, and, and, and I'm a little surprised that, that, that that's your only recommendation with respect to this process and not, uh, open to changing the standard makeup of the panels, as you call it. Yeah, so look, I'm, I, I also said in the testimony, we're open to new ideas. I'm just saying this is the, the one idea we're proposing. <clears throat> um, again, I mean, so this is, you know, and this is not unique to our city. Uh, across the country, there's always this balance in these makeup of these percent for our panels between folks with sort of uh, general artistic uh, public art knowledge, a balance of uh, um, you know, folks in uh, a particular subject area that's related to that commission and community representation. So, you know, that's endemic to this, uh, to this field, again, is this idea that there can be controversy and, and sort of disputes over ownership of the site. Um, well, I know that there are lots of other folks who have signed up to uh, testify who will obviously share their thoughts yes, and, and recommendations uh, as well. Um, I had a question about staffing at the Department mm -hmm. of Cultural Affairs, uh, particularly with, with respect to Percent for Art uh, and even some of your other programs, but this hearing is really about Percent for Art. and. Do you have enough? Obviously, I, I know and respect uh, the staff that you do have running this particular piece of the agency's work, but um, as this work becomes even more complex, as we do even more of it, um, and as public attention uh, in this space is greater than ever, uh, do you have uh, the resources and are there enough staff doing this work? Could it be done better? Could more voices be included uh, if you had even more support um, uh, in this particular part of the agency? So look, more can be done with more people always, but I do want to recognize one thing. So it, when, we, when the Monuments Commission um, Results were complete. When we looked at the, uh, uh, the workload of the unit, we did add another full-time position. So Kyla is here. She is new to the group, uh, joining Sergio and Kendall. So we did, that's a 50% increase in staff. We understood that the legislation, which you, you sponsored and passed, which requires the extra community meetings, is already has the staff out and about more. So we did add an extra position already. I don't want to uh, pass by the idea that, yes, it is more work, monuments are more work, and more community engagement is more work, but we did already add a staff member. Right. Uh, I realize it's a 50% increase from one to two, but... No, uh, two to three. Two to three, but yes. maybe we can, uh, uh, you know, give whoever is charged uh, with this incredibly important, and as we note, controversial role, um, where, uh, you know, sometimes invariably whatever decision is going to be made is going to be met with intense opposition. Yep. Um, and to, uh, to support Kendall and the team in as many ways as we possibly can, uh, obviously that is um, uh, not going to be your charge uh, after uh, uh, a couple of more weeks, but whoever uh, becomes the next commissioner uh, will obviously have to, to confront this head on yep. and, and be driving uh, us all, hopefully, into a, a, a better space. Um, 
And I'm also asking you some of these questions because this is probably the last time I'm going to be able to ask you any of yes. these questions uh, in, in this particular venue with us in these two positions. So um, uh, I want to say that. You also uh, uh, talked a little bit about LGBTQ uh, representation, which um, uh, as a gay man is, is particularly important uh, to me as well. And do we have a sense of how the LGBTQ community is represented currently? Um, have we even looked at that, either you or PDC? And um, I know, obviously, because uh, I was at the announcement with you about the Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Uh, Johnson pieces, but, uh, you know, have we even taken an inventory about LGBTQ representation in the city of New York? I don't believe we have. That I have not seen any statistics that show that, yeah. Uh, uh, obviously, the sexual orientation and, uh, and or gender identity of some of those folks who um, uh, died hundreds of years ago is perhaps hard to ascertain, but it certainly seems like uh, something we should take a look at because uh, um, the LGBTQ community is an important part of New York City. Yes. Uh, worthy of representation. Um, and. Uh, it seems to me like uh, we should have a sense of how underrepresented, because I'm just gonna guess that uh, our community is underrepresented as well. And uh, would you support something like that, taking an inventory of how LGBTQ people are represented and therefore we know the problem and, and we know how to fix it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, that, like you say, that, that going back in history to understand what a 19th century figure uh, how they would uh, self-identify uh, is might be difficult, but it sounds like, a, yeah, sure, it sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Um, obviously, we were not allowed to self-identify for a very long time. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, uh, there was uh, an article recently about the question of the gender identity of Pulaski, of the Pulaski Bridge. I think you probably read about that. Is that... Yeah, that was one. Is that yeah. your district? Yeah. It is. Uh, Part, half it is of it. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I know that we have the Public Design Commission, or a yep. couple of members of the DC Public Design Commission uh, here, uh, and uh, we're obviously going to talk to them, and then I want to obviously hear from the, all the members of the public and, and the artists uh, as well. Um, but I want to thank you. Uh, Commissioner Finkel Pearl for uh, your service uh, to the city um, and uh, all that you have done for uh, culture and the arts in the city of New York. Uh, I think as your um, uh, farewell toast on, on Friday evening indicated, um, while you are in the public realm and therefore uh, subject to folks who disagree with you and who may attack you, um, uh, and that is part of the public discourse as someone who is also in the public realm and often <laughs> uh, uh, has the good and bad of that um, as well. Uh, there are many who, who have worked with you for decades and many who respect um, uh, what you've done you know, uh, for the city of New York. I am one of those people uh, and I wanna thank you again uh, on behalf of the people of the city of New York for everything you've done. Thank you and no regrets. I am happy to have done it for six years and I'm not leaving the city, but thank you very much. It's been a, a great pleasure. I've been in many of these hearings. Uh, well, you really miss intense. these hearings, Tom. That's what I really wanna know. <laughs> I will not comment on that, but I will. <laughs> miss public service, so thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Finkel-Pearl, um, for your service. Uh, I think we're going to hear uh, from a panel, uh, mixing in some folks from the PDC and uh, the public. Uh, so Hank Thomas, uh, is Hank Thomas? Oh. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So are you sitting in for Hank Thomas? Sure, 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 sure. Is Carrie Butler? Oh, you're Carrie Butler speaking on behalf of Hank Thomas. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not even on. Um, yes, but wait, 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 one second. Yeah. Because uh, 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 then I think we're going to have to swear you in. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think we'll just have, have you testify on behalf of the PDC. Uh, we'll swear you in, and then you can speak on behalf of everyone and maybe also share what, uh, what Mr. Thomas wanted to say, uh, and then we'll go to the public uh, testimony. Okay. Is that fair? Um, could you please raise your right hand? Yes. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Feel free to, uh, if you have extra copies of your testimony, you can pass it to the sergeant at arms. Um, okay. Sorry, I don't have that many of mine, but there's one, and then there's more Frank. And then feel okay. free to begin your testimony. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. I'm here to testify today on behalf of the Public Design Commission in support of the Percent for Art program. The Public Design Commission reviews proposals for permanent artworks, including monuments and memorials on city-owned property. Both Percent for Art projects, such as the Harriet Tubman Memorial, and non-Percent for Art projects, like the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument in Central Park. Per the city charter, the PDC also acts as the caretaker and curator of the city's public art collection. Our, as, our, uh, sorry, as Commissioner Finkel Pearl noted, with the help of cultural affairs, the PDC recently completed an initial review of the city's outdoor public art collection. This data, which is available in our most recent annual report, reveals that the Percent for Art program has been instrumental in increasing the equity and diversity of our city's public art collection. The data will also be used to inform the upcoming Monuments Task Force that the um, City Council created with Local Law 1114. The PDC has found uh, that the Percent for Art process is designed with a successful balance of community engagement and guidance from art professionals. While each project is unique, and we agree that you can never please everyone, the Commission has found that in general, the Percent for Art staff is clear and professional and the panels are fair. This year, the Public Design Commission created new guidelines for monuments and memorials and added new requirements for artwork proposals that will ensure that this diversity and artistic integrity of the collection continues and is increased. Uh, the guidelines were developed in close coordination with our colleagues in other city agencies, including Cultural Affairs and the Parks Department. Uh, one of the requirements um, is that for any artwork that is commissioned outside of Percent for Art program, the artist selection process must mimic the city's Percent for Art program. So it would be a fair and open process and must include public input, diverse list of artists, and an artist selection panel comprising at least three independent art professionals, and if possible, a member of the Percent for Art staff. Uh, the Percent for Art selection panel set the bar for best practices in the field, and this policy will ensure it's implemented for all permanent public artworks in the city's collection moving forward. Um, as uh, Commissioner Finkel Pearl also mentioned, the PDC's new requirements also stipulate that for monuments and memorials, a professional historian with relevant expertise must establish the significance of the subject and thoroughly vet any proposed text and images. And this is something the Commission had been doing. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, but now it's implemented and so the teams know in advance that this will be expected. As the curators of the city's art collection, it is the PDC's responsibility to ensure high-quality public artworks that are site-appropriate and engaging, enhance the public realm, provide a contribution to art historical narratives, and will stand the test of time. While we recognize that controversy and strong opinions are always going to be part of commissioning public art, our strong partners at the Department of Cultural Affairs make the PDC's job easier through their professionalism and experience, and we truly appreciate their work. Can I read Hank's statement? Yes. Okay. Sure. And this is um, from Hank Willis Thomas, who is uh, one of our art members of the Public Design Commission. Um, it is my great pleasure to write a letter in support of New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs Percent for Art. My name is Hank Willis Thomas, and I am a conceptual artist based in Brooklyn, New York. I've created a number of large-scale public commissions, including Raise Up in Montgomery, Alabama, Love Over Rules in San Francisco, All Power to the People in Opa Laka, Florida. 
I co-created a m number of artist-run collaborative projects, including Four Freedoms, The Writing on the Wall, Question Bridge, Black Males. I am also an arts com commissioner for the Public Design Commission of the City of New York. Having worked with a number of institutions and cities across the country, my experience in working with New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs has been most rewarding. Kendall Henry and his exceptional team made my first city permanent public art commission, Unity, successful. The entire process was very hands-on and seamless. Mr. Henry and his team did everything they could do to ensure the pub everything went smoothly. Mr. Henry is one of the most graceful and intelligent city officials I have engaged with throughout my career. Even as a multi-year process, the percent for art was present, present every step of the way and available to help at every juncture. They supported and understood the artistic process. They were proven advocates for my time and resources without losing sight of the end result. As a commissioner, I have had the privilege of working with Percent for Art and various other projects. I have always been impressed with their diligence, professionalism, advocacy for the artists and their projects, as well as their commitment to bringing creative excellence throughout the city. In conclusion, I fully support efforts of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, Percent for Art, through their enormous support of artists and ambitious projects. I believe their work is extremely important in supporting these projects that benefit our lives and community at large. Thank you very much. Uh, high praise for Kendall Henry indeed. Um, and um, I appreciate you, you coming by and uh, uh, singing the praises of the Department of Cultural Affairs and the Percent for Art program. Um, I think we're going to uh, accept that in the record. Um, and thank you for your participation. And now we're gonna move to hearing from members of the public. Uh, so we will, uh, in no particular order, right? Uh, we will hear from, uh, and I hope I'm reading all these names right, Charlotte Cohen, Charlotte here, yep. Uh, Savona Bailey McLean, did I get that right? I did, great. Um, Cora Fisher, is Cora Fisher here? Great. And Jennifer Mc, McGregor, could that be right? Jennifer here? Is it Jennifer McGregor? Great, thank you. Together, okay. Okay. We just have two more panels, so we're good, right? Okay. And there are two more panels uh, after this one. Uh, the next one will be, um, I believe it's an artist panel. Uh, Jorge Luis Rodriguez, Evelyn Rodriguez, uh, Zenobia Bailey, I hope I said that right, and Janet Zweig, among others. Uh, who would like to speak first on this panel? Why don't we go left to right? My left. <laughs> yes, you're up first. Uh, good morning, I'm Charlotte Cohen, Executive Director of Brooklyn Arts Council. Um, and from late 1996 through mid-2005, I directed the New York City Percent for Art program. During my time at DCA, in a pivot from the 100 schools built in the 1990s, most of which had at least one, if not more, Percent for Art projects, the city increased its capital investment in parks and waterfront areas, as well as other infrastructure. We were able to work with DOT for the first time in many years and with the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm particularly proud of our work at New the Newtown Creek Sewage Treatment Plant in Greenpoint, where world-renowned artists George Trakis and Vito Acconci were commissioned. Trakis created the nature walk between the creek and the water treatment plant, transforming the derelict Superfund site into a lush garden. During the project's development, it was noted that people did not live close by, and the question arose as to who would use it. Trakis argued that the area would be completely different in 30 years, a uh, prescient response. This example and numerous others, including Merrill Latterman, Euclid's many years working at Fresh Kills Landfill, represent the program's ability to participate and interpret incredible transformation in our city. 
in economic development, land use, and environmental impact, for example, and to make these changes legible to our citizens. I worked on a number of memorial projects while at Percent, including those at Frederick Douglass Circle, Richard Wright's Invisible Man Sculpture at R Riverside Park, which was the sculptor Elizabeth Catlett's last public work, Flight 587 in Rockaway, Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese in Coney Island, and the extraordinary Harriet Tubman Memorial by Allison Saar in Harlem. I was and continued to be conflicted about the process for developing these memorials because on the one hand, the involvement of the percent program means there is a fair method in the artist selection that includes community members, art specialists, government representatives, and affiliated designers. On the other hand, when I was there with over 100 projects in the program's pipeline and dozens others um, on the docket during the years, um, those years, uh, with a staff of two people, it was challenging to man maintain the deep involvement and focus these memorial projects demand and deserve. I urge DCA and the Design Commission to consider the best way forward with the memorials currently under consideration by the city. These examples of permanent works of art demonstrate how artists contribute to the enhancement of our daily experience as a public space. Their inclusion means children spend their days surrounded by beautiful, colorful spaces while in school, rather than in what would otherwise be bare, sterile, cinder block buildings, and that we prepare the way for shared outdoor sites to help us remember the past and honor our present while looking towards the inevitable changes in the future. I just want to add that I thank you so much for increasing the annual allocation to percent for art and I also want to urge um, City Council, DCA, and the Design Commission to find a uh, path forward on a maintenance plan for these works of art. Um, it's irresponsible to put them into the public realm without a method and funding dedicated to maintaining them. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Savannah Bailey McLean, and I'm the executive director of the West Harlem Art Fund, a very small organization that presents public art throughout New York City, including Queens. Um, I didn't bring any prepared statement because I wasn't quite sure how this was going to flow. I'd rather this be a dialogue. I do support Percent for Art because I've had a very positive experience with Percent for Art when I served on my local community board. Me and Charlotte uh, presented Nari Ward, whose work received three standing ovations mm -hmm. from the local community board for his conception of West Harlem Piers. I also dealt with Percent for Art as they were trying to do other types of projects as well. I have to commend Kendall Henry. I've known him for many years. He is a thoughtful, conscientious curator, and no one should question him. Now, I feel that though Percent for Art is important, it does not represent all of public art. In the area that I work in, I don't deal with Percent for Art, and so I have to rely on artists and others to give funding for what I try to envision. And I have done some significant projects, Times Square. I've done Harlem, the H in Harlem. I've done Queens with Sleeping Beauty. I've done Dumbo. And I would not have been able to do it without artists working with me. But I also feel the city has to have a way to get the public more engaged because the city has changed. And I did make a proposal five years ago to Eric Adams who was the incoming borough president about creating public art districts. We have historic districts, we have business improvement districts, why not public art districts? Because the costs to bring a piece of work, whether it's temporary or permanent, is so expensive, it prohibits a lot of communities from having public art. The other problem is that oftentimes communities that are not accustomed to having art will only want what they know. And given that we are in the number one arts capital in the United States, why are we limiting ourselves to just figurative works? 
We can use new technologies. We can deal with abstract works. We could deal with sound to make us the premier city around the globe, and we're not doing it because we're focused only on sculptures that are difficult to get funding for, difficult to market, difficult to get corporate support. So I am proposing public art districts strategically throughout all five boroughs, where the, um, the parameters would be such that insurance, engineering costs could be reduced so therefore we can therefore engage more of the public and they would not fear processes like the one at percent for art where they only want to see a statue and nothing else thank you thank you um those were uh powerful and good recommendations uh and i really appreciate that um and uh appreciate the work that, uh, that you do um, and for recognizing the great borough of Queens um, in all things. Um, uh, next. Good morning, my name is Cora Fisher and I am the Curator of Visual Art Programming for Brooklyn Public Library. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. We are at BPL grateful for the support you've given us over the years. It's been instrumental in helping us open our doors for the 2.6 million residents of our borough and to begin transforming our aging buildings. With your help, BPL is amid our most significant era of rebuilding in history. One third of our 59 branches will be renovated or reconstructed over the next five years. We are improving neighborhood libraries with projects ranging from small restorations to full-scale renovations. Today, I'd like to share examples of the significant and positive impact Percent for Art has had on our large-scale renovations. Through our major capital projects, Percent for Art has provided a trusted and competitive draw for public art submissions by world-class artists. The process is inclusive, responsive both to our institutional needs and the way each library serves its local community and has attracted artists of excellence to submit proposals. At Brownsville, New Utrecht, and Eastern Parkway Libraries, Percent for Art has supported us in engaging local communities and identifying and selecting artists who will soon be starting on their design process. And I'll just say a, a bit about these projects that have started. New Utrecht Library in Bensonhurst is a bustling branch. The current building opened in 1956, excuse me, but the library's history dates to 1894 with the opening of the Free Library of the Town of New Utrecht. Artist Patrick Jacobs has been selected to design for this diverse and busy branch. His proposal is to create a trompe l'oeil vista of the neighborhood married with natural landscapes through miniature handcrafted dioramas which rival nature itself. We anticipate visitors welcome to this newly renovated branch excited to experience this artwork. Percent for Art staff were invaluable in supporting the selection and proposal process and we're eager to see this work take shape. At Brownsville Library, our 111-year-old historic Carnegie Building will be restored to its original grandeur, offering patrons upgraded and inspirational spaces thanks to the work of LTL architects. With Percent for Arts leadership and support, we have been able to nominate and select artist Chris Myers from a truly excellent group of candidates. Myers, a visual artist, children's book illustrator, and theater dramaturg, will create a series of stained glass tableau that tell stories of neighborhood luminaries with notable activists, scientists, and jazz musicians among them in an installation that will inspire youth engagement. Again, Percent for Art has been instrumental in providing a framework that asks applicants to respond meaningfully to the context of the neighborhood which Myers has so elegantly realized in his proposal. If Art. you could just summarize the last, because yeah, I, I know you've got Absolutely. Uh, we have an amazing uh, artist that was selected through the Percent for Art process, Wasa Duvernay, in Eastern Parkway. Um, and as well, BPL has been a site of engagement for the Shirley Chisholm Monument Project, so we are very grateful for that. And finally, I also just want to thank Kendall Henry and his leadership for, and for all of his colleagues at uh, Department of Cultural Affairs. It's been overall very positive for BPL. Thank you.
So far, you've got to be loving this hearing, Kendall. <laughs> Getting a lot of love, Kendall. <laughs> Still early, it may change, but... Uh, Is your mic on? Here you go. I think that's a little bit better. Um, I'm Jennifer McGregor. I'm the Senior Director of Arts Programs and Education at Wave Hill. Thank you, thank you Co Council Member Van Bramer and um, the entire committee for um, encouraging us to come to forward with our comments. Thank you to Commissioner Finkel Pearl for your fearless leadership and willingness to open new avenues, which we heard today. Thank you, Kendall Henry and the Percent for Arts staff for your tireless work and to all the agencies who enthusiastically participate in this program. So I come to you today as the first director of the Percent for Art program um, and a person who has been in the trenches with many memorial projects. Um, and also here right when the guidelines were originally written. I also come as a curator from Wave Hill and I recognize the way that this program has helped so many artists and the way that it has been a foundation for many people's careers and a way to connect with the public. Also, I'm a consultant who works nationally on public art projects and I have a perspective of how New York compares to other cities. The Percent for Art um, legislation and original guidelines were written based on the best practices of the early 1980s. And the process has held up well over time and I'm very happy to hear the changes that have been made in the last couple of years. The mix of panelists brings the di distinct areas of expertise in a focused conversation about what will work best for the given situation. You will find similar panels convening in, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, all over the country. Controversy is an important component. I mean, it, it happens at some point in every single project. There, I don't think there's any project that doesn't have a moment of co controversy somewhere along the way. Um, it is particularly prevalent in memorials where so much is at stake in terms of content, citing, constituents, and delivering a message. As a project manager for the Flight 587 Memorial in Bell Harbor, Queens, I was actually engaged by the mayor's office as a consultant to work on this project. And I have firsthand experience of how important the healing process is as part of making a memorial. This project was created to honor the lives lost in the crash of the flight en route to the Dominican Republic on November 12th, 2001. Multiple city agencies were involved and met weekly here in the mayor's office to fast track the initiative. Social workers were at every community meeting which was conducted in both English and Spanish in Washington Heights and Bell Harbor. Percent for Art was an integral part of the infrastructure to deal with the considerable skepticism along the way. An outpouring of support at the dedication ceremony confirmed that the process had served the participants and de who were deeply affected by the loss. This, oh my gosh, we're almost at the end. The city has embraced um, this challenge to do these new memorials and it's very heartening to see the work that has, been, has gone into the community engagement for each project. I want new Percent for Art to succeed to be excellent, the staff is strong, but let's be creative about how we reinforce the efforts and tap into the immense knowledge base in our city to commission, maintain, and engage the public about these extraordinary projects. I have great faith in the process and support finding ways to encourage and reinforce this tremendously important program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so between Tom Finkel Pearl Kendall and the two of you on the committee, uh, we have uh, just two other uh, percent of our uh, uh, leaders who are not here, but uh, that's uh, a pretty good coverage. So for the two of you who used to run the program, um, and, and for you who haven't been around when, when it was essentially created, um, what recommendations would you make uh, and how would we change it? Um, it's great to hear that you think that it's held up well since uh, the beginning um, with some modifications that we at the council have actually recently made, but uh, have we done enough? Have we, have we changed it 
enough or have we rested on uh, a set of guidelines that were made uh, almost 40 years ago uh, where the city has changed dramatically in those 40 years, but the program has largely remained very static. Well, I would note that, um, and I did say that this was based on those programs of the early 1980s. Um, percent for our programs that have developed since then have been able to um, create a formula that allowed a, a percentage of the percent to go to maintenance and also administration and also community outreach and engagement, you know, be it apps or websites or all sorts of ways of engaging the public. Um, the, the way that our capital budget works here in New York doesn't, and the way our law is structured doesn't really allow for that, but I think benchmarking some of the other programs in the country to see if there are ways that we could find other funding sources for those things um, would be very important. Because that, I mean, a staff of, as we've noted, a staff of now three, which is fabulous to have three people, um, to manage these mo monument projects and the in, in important percent for art projects throughout the five boroughs is just really, you know, San Francisco, I, they have like, I can't even tell you how many people they have. Like, the other cities have, you, you know, and they have 2%. Yeah, they have 2% of the capital. Anyway, we don't need, to, we but could spend a lot of time comparing to other cities. Um, New York is really um, well respected, but there could be other ways of, of doing things that I don't think are the fault of the program itself. I agree entirely. It's really de so dependent on the capital budget process and um, um, how that funding is allowed to be used. So that dictates so much of the uh, process and, and as Jennifer noted, the way that um, money can be spent. Yeah. And I realize, uh, first of all, I just want to say to um, Cora uh, as a former library staff person, myself before I was elected and chair of this committee. Um, I think it is uh, so cool that the Brooklyn Public Library uh, has a curator of visual art programming. Um, and, uh, uh, and that BPL in particular is taking that so seriously. Thank you, we are, absolutely. Um, and, and lastly, for this panel, and I realize um, that uh, some of you on this panel uh, may have had zero involvement in the Sims uh, uh, project, so you don't have to uh, chime in. Um, but uh, if anyone would like to, is there anything that you know about that process, recognizing, and I'm willing to stipulate that virtually every project that we undertake here is gonna engage some controversy, as you said. But is there anything that you think uh, um, could have been done differently that might have um, reduced uh, some of the controversy there. Again, you don't have to chime in, but if you'd like to. I'd just like to say that I feel one of the biggest problems with um, New Yorkers nowadays, because New York has really changed. A lot of people don't understand how government agencies work, so that's number one. So they don't understand the process. Two, a lot of people, like I mentioned before, they look at art from their own perspective, from their own knowledge. And I, and I know for a fact, because for the Tito Puentes, where we were trying to get the public in East Harlem to look at art differently, that there were so many more options that they could have to make a fabulous presentation, they rejected all of them to go for a figurative piece, because that's what they're familiar with. This is why I'm saying we need to engage the public to look at art differently. It's no longer this statue. It could be so many different things, but if you're not familiar with it, and that's no fault to the community, you're only gonna go with what you know. So the community saw Vinnie Bagwell's work, and I know Vinnie Bagwell's work, and then they looked at, or maybe they didn't get to see, Simone Lee's. But if you're familiar with Simone Lee, you know that that was a stellar artist. That would have made your community proud. But they didn't understand that. They went with, here's the artist who came to visit. 
here's the artists who talked with us, they cared about us. But when you're looking at public art, particularly monuments, it's not just about your community. It's about the city of New York and the possibilities that could have come out of the Simone Lee uh, selection would have been overwhelmingly positive for the community if they understood. So I think it behooves us to explain better to the public opportunities so that they could see it and therefore be trusting of those of us who do this day in and day out that we're going to look out for you. We're not going to try to shortchange you or be highbrow. We are going to care about you and they would have looked at it a lot more differently. That's my comment. Charlotte? Yeah, I, I appreciate those comments so much and, and agree. Um, I would just note uh, something that someone, a resident from Harlem said to me when we were starting on the projects I did uh, that I mentioned, the memorial project specifically, which was until people see themselves on pedestals, mm -hmm. they, it's very mm -hmm. hard to consider work that is not figurative in nature, that is not, that is conceptual or abstract. So I really appreciate that sort of need to first cover those bases, right? And uh, for people to see their own community reflected and their own selves reflected. Um, this is taking a huge step back, my comment uh, around the Sims Memorial, but I think these things have moved forward so quickly um, and perhaps without the consideration that would have really benefited the process if they had slowed down. In my opinion, I'm not, I don't really understand why we needed a memorial on that pedestal beyond Sims, quite frankly. The fact that it was removed um, is really important for people today, for people of the past, and to recognize that um, removal. Yes, I agree with that, but I, I really have to question whether people in the future will know who that person was care who he was, care why it was replaced, understand the process that happened. So I, I think we have to think uh, towards the future as well as the past and our current feelings that are so um, intense and, and significant right now when we're in this moment and in this process. So I recommend slowing these, these, uh, the process down tremendously to have real reflection and uh, community dialogue and consideration around around the process. Uh, so I want to thank uh, this panel for uh, uh, weighing in and uh, uh, for uh, caring about public art uh, in the city of New York. Um, so I want to uh, thank this panel for uh, being here. And uh, before I call the next uh, panel, I want to recognize we've been joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo uh, on our committee. And I think, I think this next panel is artists, right, uh, who uh, want to speak uh, to this issue. Um, and that is, as I mentioned, Jorge Luis Rodriguez and Evelyn Rodriguez. Are they here? Yep. Uh, Zenobia Bailey, is that correct? Zenobia, OK, great. And uh, Janet Zweig. Janet Zweig is here. Is that three or four people? Four, okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, Jonathan, I think we'll start with you when you're ready and when the Sergeant at Arms is ready and has all of uh, the testimony. And then uh, our last panel will be Marina Ortiz. If Marina is still with us, Todd Fine, Raul Rothblatt, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Jacob Morris, uh, and Margaret Blair. I hope I got all of those names right.
Okay, we were all uh, distracted by the beautiful book that uh, uh, Jorge Luis Rodriguez uh, has presented us, um, but uh, why don't we uh, start with the testimony. The light should be on right before you, the little button. Yes. Great. Can you thank me? you. Now we can hear Great. you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Janet Zweig. I'm an artist and educator. In 1994, I received my first public art commission from New York's Percent for Art program for Walton High School in the Bronx. Since then, I've completed many co uh, commissions around the United States. Um, currently, we are extremely lucky to have Kendall Henry directing Percent for Art. He is one of the country's best, most renowned, most accomplished public art experts. He and his excellent staff of two now are currently managing, um, I heard another number, but I think it's 137 projects. Um, this seems impossible, and yet they are doing an amazing job bringing world-class artworks to five boroughs year after year. Um, looking at other percent programs, um, in comparison, San Francisco has 10 staff with 75 projects, so, and I have some other um, program numbers, but yes, they probably could use some more staff. But mostly, I'd like to address the importance of art expertise on artist selection panels. Um, in my experience, Percent for Art does an excellent job with this, and their selection process is extremely transparent. Um, the panels are diverse. Um, in comparison to other programs, I think their um, uh, panels are, are really well handled. Um, the current standards are to have art professionals comprise more than half a selection panel. Now, it's occasionally suggested that only community members should choose artists, um, and this causes me to wonder why art is one field where expertise is so undervalued. If you need a doctor, you typically choose someone with expertise in medicine. Why wouldn't we have people with expertise help choose the art that will be part of the fabric of New York for years to come? Here's an example. The jurors for the Vietnam Memorial were eight internationally recognized artists and designers. One juror, speaking about Maya Lin's handwritten proposal and her impressionistic sketch of a black wedge on a blue-green background said, at first I didn't pick it out, but the longer I looked at it, the more convinced I was that it was the one. There was extreme opposition once her proposal was chosen. Many people just couldn't understand it. They wouldn't have picked it out. But the Veterans Fund navigated the controversy with the help of government allies, and as you know, the Vietnam Memorial is one of our best-loved public works. Public art very often draws controversy, and more often than not, it's initiated by only one person or a very few people. So education and outreach are crucial for success. Percent for Art currently does this outreach extraordinarily well. I have to admit I was amazed by the fact that it was a year of outreach for the memorial prog uh, program that I, uh, memorial that I just heard about, um, and how much outreach, outreach there was. Um, perhaps more staff could bring deeper outreach, but the most important thing they need is support from city officials like you. Um, with your support, they can turn controversy into productive civic discourse and an understanding of the stakeholders' needs and desires. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, next. Okay, I didn't know how to um, go about putting this presentation together, so I just put down my experience, <clears throat> excuse me, as um, a, an artist, um, public artist. Um, my name is Zenobia Bailey, and thank you so very much for inviting me to this um, testimony. I would like to thank everyone at the Arts for Transit and MTA program for believing in my artwork enough for it to be installed in such an amazing space at the number seven Hudson Yard subway stop in 2015. Around 20 years ago, so it seems, I submitted images of my work to several arts organizations, slides, registers, in hopes of possible public art commission. After that, I had, short, I had been shortlisted several times to compete for public art commissions in New York City, which I never won. Each of these past submissions has their unique stories, such as my application to the J Street Borough Hall's train station in Brooklyn, which I did not get. I was very nervous during my panel presentation because I had really 
terrible renderings for the presentation. I had created works of art that I thought the panel, the panel wanted to see in the subway, but my concept did not read well, and uh, my printer had really messed up my image. When all of us artists were waiting together, one of the artists among us had applied for the same co commission, said, don't be discouraged if you don't get it. He advised that I should learn from this experience to strengthen me for the next time. Then he added that this was his sixth time trying and he was going to keep trying. He said this like it was part of, of our job as artists to be con constantly rejected and bounce back from the results. What he had said had some comfort, but later I saw that he had gotten the commission. I witnessed the light at the end of his tunnel, and I was in that same tunnel. At, the po at that point, I saw a victorious, ride, a victorious ride of rejection, not my victory, but his victory. Yet, it was my victory also in a sloppy second kind of way. Then came the Hudson Yards shortlist call to apply to present artwork alongside three other established artists. I was very intimidated about the project because nothing was built yet and everyone at MTA kept saying how big this project was. I was beyond scared, but the director of the project, manage, manager, and project manager, and everyone at MTA told me to do what I do and don't try to please the panel. Fear, fear hunger, and MTA, believed in me, but um, I wanted just to say that um, I, after I got that commission, I had um, received several other commissions, Coney Island, which Kendall Henry, Henry, I too must praise him, was a saint supporting me through that project, and um, uh, I'm, I'm the, the, my notes are all messed up because I was just watching. No, feel free to read. Your testimony, Ms. Bailey. Okay. <clears throat> um, I was beyond scared, but the director manager fear. Um, I tried to, to I try not to please the panel. Fear, hunger, and MTA, MTA's belief in my work was the motivation which resulted in winning the commission. If truth be told, the Hudson Yard Commission jump-started the beginning of my art practice. I don't know what my life would not, would not only, and not only my career would be like if I had not gotten that opportunity. I could not have asked for more, a more supportive group of people than everyone that I worked with at the Art for Transfer program at NTA. It was a major game changer for me how my crochet was converted into three large overhead gla glass tile mosaics created by the masterful mosaic fabricator Stephen Mayoto. It all seems like a natural evolution of materials of fiber to, uh, to, to uh, fiber in glass public places. Um, arts, okay, I messed up here, okay. And then nonstop, but anyway but how my crochet was converted into um, um, glass tiles for the mosaic. Um, a practice artist, the project manager, okay. Um, because of this opportunity, I have since received four public art commissions, a pedestrian walkway paper and structural design for Coney Island, which I was you know, grateful to um, Kendall Henry for that support that he gave me through a very challenging project. Um, a um, public art piece in St. Petersburg, Florida, which was a mini Hudson Yards um, project. <clears throat> the Grand Reading Room with Martin Luther King Library in Washington, D.C. Um, Mies van der Rohe was the architect which is like uh, pulling a 50-year-old dream out of a hat, and a permanent installation at a um, sports arena in Los Angeles, which I'm just now starting. All this has afforded me the opportunity to realize 
my fulfillment of practicing my art full time for the first time in my life, which I was beginning to believe I was delusional to, to, mm. to pursue. Becoming a fiber artist using the medium of crochet and the aesthetic of the domestic craft of the African American homemaker and caregiver as a global on a global scale, I would like I would not be in the position if it was not for the Hudson Yards Commission and MTA believing in my work and supporting the development of the project, which was enabled which has enabled me to contribute my vision to humanity. Thank you so much, uh, and. Uh, I have seen your work. It's uh, amazingly beautiful um, and quite a success story. I'm also really glad you're not the artist behind the vessel, having, based on my say. comments earlier today <laughs> um, about the vessel. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for your testimony. And uh, Kendall, uh, um, uh, Miss Bailey just called you a saint. So oh, this yeah. joyride you're on here today at this hearing it's it's it can only go downhill from here. Uh, I think we all understand may I, that. May I also make a comment? Sure. Lori Cumbo has also been a major support in my career when when she was uh, director of the Macabo Museum. Sure. She was a major supporter of the artists in the community. So she too is the reason why I'm here. That's wonderful. Um, and uh, we'll finish this panel. Um, uh, and uh, and then we can uh, see if anyone on the pan uh, here, this panel wants to ask any questions before we hear from the last panel. Uh, my name is Jorge Rodriguez, and I'm having some problems with my vocal cords, so I'm asking my beautiful wife to read my statement. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to kind of paraphrase and, and call from what we've had here because it's become more uh, apparent what we're trying to accomplish. So first of all, good morning, uh, good afternoon actually, city council members and elected officials, private um, citizens. Um, we should thank uh, the opportunity to present here today. And so we're going back to the beginning because Jorge was the first person selected and the first commission completed. Um, he was invited among a group of artists in 1984 to be considered to develop public artwork uh, for the newly enacted Percent for Art program. Uh, he presented, he had a portfolio of already 20 years of artwork, graphic design, painting, and sculpture in, in different media. Um, he was really very um, uh, pleased to be selected for a site-specific project at Harlem Art Park. Um, he had invested um, great um, years of teaching, developing curriculum and, uh, in the schools and cultural community-based organizations and museums, including residency at the Studio Museum in, in, uh, in Harlem. Uh, actually, he did the residency with David Hammonds and Charles, the late Charles Abramson and at El Museo del Barrio. Uh, as the park was undergoing construction, it had not yet been uh, completed. He visited regularly, looked at the dynamics in the park, but, but with particular focus on nature, which is one of a, a running theme in his works. Um, and what his impressions uh, inspired him to do was to concentrate on actually the concept of growth, because this would be the first uh, project to be uh, completed. And that's what the sculpture was ultimately named, growth. Um, he was inspired by the dynamics in the park, as well as his experiences when he was growing. And um, he would, uh, in his tropical garden, would uh, plant seeds, watch them grow, and, and see the transformation in them. And he saw the correlation between that and what he was trying to accomplish with the sculpture. So we were just talking on the way here how uh, we worked hand in hand with uh, Jennifer McGregor and um, all the people that were present at the ribbon cutting ceremony in June of 1985 are, you know, aside from Jennifer, are, are no longer with us. Bess Meyerson was there, Major Koch, uh, Anthony Gleedman, uh, Henry Stern. And, uh, but we still have long lasting relationships with the school that is right crossing from um, the park, the, the, their active participation. Uh, there's some art programs where the students do come in and visit the park. And the, also um, 
having um, the opportunity to have a uh, 30th anniversary celebration uh, sponsored by New York City Parks. Uh, we also had a retrospective uh, work at Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, which is just a block away. So it revived the concept. And one of the most wonderful things that happened at that occasion is um, that they, the park fulfilled its original purpose, which is to have ongoing art installations. And there have been 15, it says here in the statement 10, but they've been, we actually realized there have been 15 installations nearby uh, through the effort of, a coordinated effort with Connie Lee of the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance. They've made a corridor, public art corridor between Marcus Garvey Park, Harlem Art Park, and the local community business partners and cultural institutions. So um, I, I'm welcome to ask <laughs> questions. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, this book is beautiful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, uh, we were just looking at some of the photos uh, from uh, your residency and, uh, and some of those early photos with Mayor Koch and uh, Bess Meyerson and uh, your uh, career is uh, incredibly impressive and your work uh, Thank you. truly remarkable. Um, it's beautiful. That photo of, uh, of yourself and uh, <laughs> David Hammonds and uh, uh, Charles Abramson is remarkable, um, yes. absolutely remarkable. Um, so thank you uh, for uh, your legacy. And on a side note, I, I just read that uh, uh, you were born in San Juan, uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, I yeah. love Puerto Rico um, and uh, have a home there. And it's uh, uh, great to see uh, uh, a Puerto Rican-born artist succeed uh, and leave such a huge imprint here in New York City. Um, it's Thank remarkable. you very much. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you all for being here. It is uh, such an honor to have so many of our creative giants here today in the City Council. And I'm very much a and energy and vibrations and frequency person. And it's so important to have your energy here in City Hall. It's important that what you're saying, the work that you're talking about, the perspectives that you bring are really very critical to the political process. And so I hope that through your presentations and your testimonies here today, that more individuals from the cultural community will understand that their voice is equally important to all of the many topics that we discuss here in City Hall. So we thank you certainly for coming here, for testifying, and being a part of the political process. Because oftentimes, uh, we have many different political views, and some will say they have nothing to do with politics, but politics and government interfaces with every part of our lives. So it's so important that you're here today and I thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for participating uh, and uh, for creating a better New York City. Uh, our final panel, this panel is excused, thank you, thank you. Uh, is uh, Margaret Blair, uh, Raul Rothblatt, Jacob Morris, Todd Fine, and Marina Ortiz. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms will take your testimony. There are five chairs up there, and we will Is this everyone? No, um, how to get someone with a camera. Uh, <laughs> may I ask, is this being live streamed at all? Yes, it is.
You'll start, and then we'll go down the line. All right, um, good afternoon. Thank you for hearing our, uh, my testimony. My name is Raul Rothblatt, and I'm here to present the Sisters in Freedom, Freedom proposal, and I've given your committee um, a dozen letters of support. Actually, since this morning, we have two more coming in. The uh, council member, Stephen Levin, also signed on the letter, and I'll send that as well, as well as assembly member, Joanne Simon. Um, uh, the process of creating a monument should live up to the ideals you want to memorialize. Today, I'm presenting a proposal to build a statue called Sisters in Freedom at Willoughby Square Park, recently renamed Abolitionist Place Park by Brooklyn Community Board 2. This proposal is a model for what the monument process can look like. It's sited at a historically significant location, rises up from grassroots, exemplifies an educational design philosophy, and celebrates the voice of the descendants of the honorees. The city has already funded, already funded a contract requiring Willoughby Square Park to build a monument, but this legal commitment does not require percent for art. This is the opportunity for the cultural committee to try, I would say, a better process. Our choice of Ida B. Wells and four other African-American suffragists would educate generations of New Yorkers about a fierce group of women who fought against lynching and for economic and civil rights. This selection would elevate both these empowered women and New York City's central role in the history of their movement. After Ida B. Wells' newspaper was attacked by a racist mob in 1892 in Memphis, she moved to downtown Brooklyn, where many strong black institutions already, operate, already operated. The women here assisted her with public speaking, fundraising, and publicity. They drove the formation of the influential black women's club movement. It is impossible to understand the progress of the civil rights movement without understanding the work of these women. The selection of Sisters in Freedom by this committee is obvious and deserving. Their activism is a model for us and we hope you choose it as a template to build monuments citywide. Thank you. And under time. Uh, next. <clears throat> Uh, Jacob Morris, Harlem Historical Society. Um, by the way, I, I was responsible for the co-naming of Gold Street, Ida B. Wells Place, and um, uh, I'm responsible for originally coming up with the concept of a group memorial honoring these five great women from Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad that the majority leader is here today uh, because I know that she carries on in a tradition of these five great women from Brooklyn and that this Sisters in Freedom Memorial would honor, it would honor their struggle and it would honor Brooklyn and in so doing it would also honor New York City and there's the connection to bringing history to life because Abolitionist Place Park is one block from where Ida B. Wells lived. Uh, and that leads me to my five points. Monument sighting. Now this is a real problem, you know, with uh, what's going on. You got Elizabeth Jennings Graham gets thrown off the streetcar in 1854 at the intersection of Pearl and Chatham, downtown Manhattan. And by the way, you know, that was 100 years before Rosa Parks. They just did a statue to Rosa Parks in, in, in Montgomery. And that statue is located in the immediate vicinity of where Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus and where they stopped the bus and where she was taken off the bus and arrested. And yet, somehow, and I'm so glad, Mr. Chairman, that you brought that out. Who makes these decisions? Who really made that decision about Mother Cabrini? And these other citing decisions are, are verging on the inexplicable. And we did FOIL requests. We've gotten no response as to how the decisions were arrived at 
for citing. That includes the decision for the Lyons family in Seneca Village in Central Park, more than a mile from where Seneca Village was. It makes no sense. Elizabeth Jennings Graham at Central uh, at Grand Central Station when she was taken or thrown off in her Sunday church clothes all the way downtown. And the Colored Sailors Home, by the way, was located at 330 Pearl Street. If you're going to honor the Lyons family, uh, it should be by the Colored Sailors Home. So I know you've just covered one of your five uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, recommendations. So I'm going to ask you, Mr. Morris, if you can uh, uh, run through the rest quickly. Be more concise, <laughs> yes. Okay, I just, you know, uh, th th this really, uh, I, I feel very, very passionate about that we can do better here in New York City. Uh, the Public Design Commission, uh, they've adopted some new guidelines in terms of um, historian input. Um, I would like that to become permanent. I would like there to be a seat on the Public Design Commission for a historian. Uh, and uh, this is especially critically important to fulfill the educational function of monuments that have historical themes. There are two categories of monuments, not one. There's the aesthetic monuments, and then there's the historically themed monuments. Now, uh, one of the prior panelists said, oh, um, well, the community, they like figurative monuments when it comes to historic. That's right. The people of the city, they like figurative monuments because of the educational function of historically themed monuments, not abstract or quotation mark contemporary stylings. Um, figurative has an educational function for the community. Consideration of best practices around the United States in regards to monument siting selection and artist selection should be examined and considered for adoption here in New York City for approval and to improve our selection criteria and processes. And um, the Percent for Art program, uh, you were right, this would go downhill for Kendall. <laughs> Um, a buddy, this isn't anything I haven't expressed in personally, um, has an abstract and contemporary art bias. Um, that's not his fault necessarily. <laughs> um, because we haven't had a whole slew of monuments with historical functions. Now that we do, we need to consider the educational function of historically themed monuments. Um, and so figurative art should not be discriminated against. Um, Kendall has gone on the record in public stating that they were going to pick Simone Lee when they went back to the office in spite of the overwhelming strong sentiment of those wonderful ladies in East Harlem who fought so long against Sims. These so, are a very knowledgeable group of women and, and I have, I, I, ju I just can't say enough about them. Uh, that's in, fair. In support. Um, Impro uh, please, Mr. Chairman, yep. impro improve the compliance mechanisms for transparency in the legislation that you already passed. Got it. I, I see that. Thank you very much, Mr. Morris. Obviously, you've uh, invoked uh, uh, Kendall uh, <laughs> uh, in a public statement. Uh, you know, I don't know if he wants to respond in any way, shape, or form, but uh, uh, I just want to um, give him the opportunity, if he'd like to uh, correct the record in any way or, or respond. Uh, next panelist. Hello, my name is Margaret Blair. I'm a performing artist, an educator, and a scholar. For the record, we haven't spoken about anything today. I haven't spoken to any of them, and it's amazing how 
I have like a similar sentiment. When I'm not studying anthropology and education, I teach dance in a couple of public schools in Harlem. I've spent the last, I spent many years in the past drawing, painting, and sculpting through my studies at uh, in the fine arts program at FIT. But I care very, very deeply about historical content, lack of representation, and erasure of communities of color in public spaces. So this is what I understand about why I'm here. The process may have worked in the past. I'm not taking anything away from Percent for Art and not saying that they haven't given so much to artists and artists of color. I just really appreciate that work. I think it's hard work, whether you're working for the government or you're working for a private industry. It's hard work. But I understand also, and I've spoken to Mr. Finkel Pearl briefly about it, I understand also that at the same time, the public can be regarded and dis disregarded at the same time. So the way public involvement, the way and the manner that they're being engaged in new works seems broken or something needs to be fixed. It's maybe outdated. So I think that the community, like myself, and I'm always in Councilman May Zell's office. I live in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm in his office constantly about everything. I think the public, like myself, we are critical enough to actually chime in for some things and the way they're being engaged and then disengaged, their opinions are disregarded at the last minute. I think it's disrespectful. I think the communities who live around these particular projected works can critically um, chime in and give their recommendations and their advice as well. And um, a lot of what's happening, it's just not aiding in the process. So I've heard someone say today that, you know, we need, you know, we need to slow this down. I don't think so. I don't think we need to slow it down. I just think that the way the community's involved needs to change. I just want to thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next. Yes, I'm Todd Fine, <clears throat> president of the Washington Street Advocacy Group. And I'd first like to offer my support for the Sisters in Freedom initiative. I think that's the way that this process could have been done, to talk to community groups, see what sentiment is out there, rather than executive decisions by politicians, which was how all of these major monuments were made. Now, the commissioner uh, repeatedly said that public art is inherently controversial. And if we accept that as a catch-all explanation, we could say this was inevitably going to be controversial, that, that this large-scale monument initiative would inevitably be controversial. But is that true? No. There are reasons why this monument and boom initiative became extremely controversial. And they are the insufficient funding and inferior processes for a widely ambitious program at Percent for Art. The, ambitious, and the ambition can be commended. The implementation cannot. According to my count provided to members of the committee, at least 12 major large-scale monuments are underway, many with short-term deadlines in one or two years. Major experts of public art process do not believe this is possible. The former director of Percent for Art just explained how a single large-scale monument taxed their resources. How about 12? And PDC said all privately po uh, proposed monuments will also go through Percent for Art now? How is any of this possible? It is irresponsible for this committee not to press further about how this new initiative is possible. Percent for Art has invited people to speak about past successes and the capability of staff, but no one is testifying how this specific program, which is distinct from the com commissions in the past, can achieve this project on this scale. We have entered a twilight zone, and there's no roadmap, and there's no oversight. Three staff at Percent for Art. This is absurd. It's uh, stressing all agencies to the breaking point, PDC and Parks, as well as PDC. The root of the scandal is, uh, one, ignoring and neglecting the city advisory councils, and two, a rushed, under-resourced process that has led to rash and sloppy decisions that may lead to inferior works in ill-considered locations. There are several problems. First, weak responsiveness to community sentiment and organic driven projects. Long before the Monument Initiative, there were existing public art initiatives for Tito Puente, Brooklyn Abolitionism, for the literary heritage of Little Syria. These initiatives developed organically, but they're now at the back of the list, and there's, they probably may not be completed for three, four, or five years, and we, nobody knows how quickly any of these initiatives are going to be completed with dates of two or three years. Second, um, second is that we mar 
marginalize the Blue Ribbon Commissions. We have lots of testimony from people from the public art program and from other artists, but we don't have any of the members of those 40, those, the 18-member Women uh, Commission on advising the women's selection, who, uh, Harriet Sini, who the uh, CUNY professor who was on the commission, said it was a charade. They're, they recommended group monuments, and those recommendations were overruled, and the, the people on the Mayor's Monument Commission also said that their recommendations were ignored, that the final decisions were only, only took place in 15 minutes at the end of the third meeting. So they, they didn't feel they had any agency. The decisions were made by political leadership. There's no community involvement, and there needs to be more oversight. Third, we've neglecting community knowledge and sentiment in the selection of these monuments. These can be seen in these location problems that, that my colleague raised. That Elizabeth Jennings Graham at Central, Grand Central Station makes no sense. Billy Holiday, which he didn't get into. There are huge sentiment in Addisley Park to cite that in Queens where uh, the hu there was a huge jazz move. Why do it at Queensborough Hall? Why didn't anybody talk to the people of Queens before we did this? This is what this committee needs to do. Have in rigorous oversight into these specific siting decisions, explain why they were occurred, and then we can sort this out. The, this monument initiative is not going to be solved within the next year or two. There's 12 monuments in the process. Let's slow it down and let's do them all properly. Let's scrutinize it, do it properly, engage the community. Thank you. <laughs> you speak really fast, and but read remarkably well, <laughs> remarkably fast. Um, because that, that was like 15 minutes of testimony <laughs> condensed into three. And the truth is, I understood every word of it because. <laughs> yeah, no, that was. High school debate. That was really, really? That was really impressive, actually. I mean, maybe some of the older folks remember the, the, the commercials where the guy used to like speak really fast. That's who you reminded me of. Um, uh, what was that? Yes, 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 that's a different situation altogether. Uh, um, but I just want to say, uh, you do raise a lot of real issues um, and important issues, and, um, uh, and I, I share some of the concerns, which is part of why, obviously, in this moment of transition, right, Tom is leaving, and, uh, uh, and there'll be a new commissioner, we hope, soon. Uh, but I, I, I did start this hearing with uh, uh, talking to Tom and getting him to talk on the record about exactly who was making decisions. Um, and that, that is important to me and I think important for all of us to understand <laughs> what's happening here. So um, there is more oversight to be done. There are a lot more questions to be answered. Um, we did talk about the resources question uh, and um, and I just want to say I have um, concerns. Uh, I want to let the next person speak as well, because I'm afraid if I give you the mic no, again, you're going to give one comment. another 15 minutes in no, no. three minutes no, again. I, 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 I think you, I, do, I agree this committee can do good oversight, but we need to have a roadmap of how this 12 boom, monument boom is going to happen. We can't just have to beg for information. I agree. Absolutely. Last but not least. Yes, um, I also can do that kind of speed reading, um, which I normally do at community boards, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, I have a written statement that you have um, there you can refer to later. I am gonna take the liberty of taking a little bit extra time so that I don't have to speed um, talk, but I appreciate everything you said. Um, so I'm here to talk about the process for the selection of the replacement of the Sim statue. And from a little bit what I'm hearing today, uh, in testimony and um, side comments, I'm actually going to respond to some of those comments um, to clarify. So for example, there were not 19 meetings held um, in terms of engaging the community in East Harlem regarding the replacement for the Sim statue. There were three community-wide meetings held at the New York Academy of Medicine, Schomburg Center, and then at the Museo del Barrio for the final artist selection. So those were three community-wide meetings. Their committee that was formed did in fact meet um, beginning after the statue was taken down, but does not total 19. And the committee meetings did not always include representatives from uh, Department of Cultural Affairs or Percent for Art. So just want to clarify that. Um, we were promised in the beginning of all of this um, that uh, there would be a million dollars allocated for this and had, is separate from the uh, 
Women's Monument Project. So we just want to clarify that that's, we want to make sure that that uh, promise is kept. Um, so, and uh, talk about the process. So we were always, we were always advised by Tom and Kendall that um, the community's voice was an advisory voice. We were never promised that we would have the final say. So I just want to make that clear. However, the process leading up to that, um, the things that we were promised did not happen. So for example, we did not have that many meetings. Uh, towards the end, as we got closer to um, the artist selection panel, we were told that we were, the committee would have an opportunity to interview the five, at that time, five finalists. That never happened, and we asked why. We asked to have someone um, from the committee um, represent us on that um, artist selection panel, and we only thought to ask that at, towards the very end, and I'm glad that we did. Um, we had to push back to get that. The person that was uh, appointed to the uh, panel is an expert, so she qualified, uh, but we were never, um, we were never got an opportunity to speak to the artists, not to interrogate them or anything, but just to get a sense of uh, their thoughts uh, and their vision. Uh, we were never t uh, told the names or titles or, or credentials for the artist selection panel. We only met them that very day. Um, the artist selection panel that we saw, again, I'm gonna take the liberty of more time because this is important. Um, the well, I will, I will, uh, we will, we will certainly allow you to uh, You're not uh, going have anywhere. extra yeah. time as we have several other people, but I, I just want to say there are also limitations. But uh, Thank you, because going forward, this needs to be corrected sure. and addressed. Sure. So the artist selection panel, from what I can see, consisted of only one woman of color, and she is the woman that we pushed to have and we had to push to have on that panel. There were, in fact, only three women out of four, uh, seven. There, um, uh, were, I believe, four white uh, people, white people, um, <laughs> and three people of color. Okay, I'm just gonna put, so we were like kind of shocked when we walked in, it's like, we didn't know, you know, they were briefly introduced and all that, but we just didn't know. There was no literature handed out, no information, um, so we also questioned the budget for community outreach, because in fact, the community members were the ones that did that outreach for free. Everything from printing and posting flyers and attending community board meetings and, and getting people to the event, which we did. So we questioned the budget as well. We'd like to see more transparency on that as well as a million dollars. We wanna make sure a million dollars is a, you know, applied to this particular project. And, we, and I say that because, I mean, you all, okay, so you all know that Simone Lee was um, selected by the artist. When I walked into that event, I had no prejudgment. Most of the people that um, were, uh, okay, going back again. So um, the city also promised to have an online, online engagement process two weeks prior to the artist selection process so that the general public citywide could input um, on the um, artists that were finalized, right? So that wasn't put up online until five days before the event, which is ridiculous. And we had to promote it. And the artist um, imagery that was presented was also ridiculous. We couldn't even see or make out the work of at least two of the artists very clearly. Um, so during the event, um, I walked in and many others walked in uh, surprised to hear that um, only one artist was gonna be joining us. Um, and so I'm like, okay, whatever. So we're still looking at the presentations on screen and we still can't make out pretty much any of the artists' work. And I'm gonna say, it's not a um, Simone versus Vinnie Bagwell. What was shown to us on the screen of Simone Lee's work was a very shadowy outline of a woman reclined. That's the same exact image that was put online for the general public, for the city one. We couldn't make out what it was. Had Simone Lee attended our, and or entrusted and respected our community enough to show us her vision, things might have gone differently. Had we seen, were able to see what she was going, what she was presenting, it might have gone very differently, but she didn't show up. And for whatever reason, we were not entrusted or respected enough to see her proposal. 
which is ridiculous. And that's why people were outraged, including the chair of the community board, community board 11, including Councilwoman Diana Ayala, who can't be here today, uh, but who did speak out on this uh, formally at a press conference. So, um, and then also we're being subjected to, after the fact, hearing audio of people involved in that selection process assuring that the artists, um, that Simone Lee's art will go up and they're gonna do whatever they need to do to make that happen. This is after the city and Tom Finkelpearl uh, announced her withdrawal. And people even in this audience um, snickering and, and saying that East Harlem, y'all a bunch of uh, bitching and complaining, exactly what was said, okay? Bitching and complaining about the Tito Puente statue, we've been waiting for that for 10 years. Okay, a certain amount of funding was um, per, um, given, but we need more funding for that in reality in 2019. So I really ask. don't appreciate people involved in that selection process ridiculing my community, calling us stupid, telling us we don't know art, we don't know good art, Vinnie Bagwell's art sucks, she's a bad artist, and these are the people that are gonna be carrying out and fulfilling this mandate. Well, uh, obviously that's, all that you just said there is unacceptable uh, to say about the East Harlem community and those who have a different uh, perspective. Um, so I appreciate everything that you've said. I appreciate- Two more points, two more points. Some of what So the also, the figurative issue, Vinnie Bagwell's presentation goes beyond figurative art. She's talking about LED lighting and eternal flame, um, a lot more than just figurative art. Okay, and it's not bad art. And it's, so she was there for seven hours, answered every single one of our questions, presented an actual model, said she's open to changing somewhat. So of course people embraced her. And then finally, the, the proposal or idea around not insufficient funding and possible public-private partnerships, I totally do not support that at all because you're opening up a can of worms for developers to come in. Um, no, don't, don't go there. The city needs to invest more money into the uh, Percent for Art agency, and process needs to be um, transparent, and there are processes in place that should be followed and respected, Great. but they're not being. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for uh, all that you have to say. Uh, Councilmember Barron has uh, joined us, and I want to give her an opportunity to weigh in on this important issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you to the panels that have been here. I haven't heard all of them, but I will certainly review them and make sure. I just wanted to put some uh, items onto the record. Uh, much of this talk about having these statues and having cultural representations is a result of the fight that began against the statue of Dr. Marion Sims, who, as we have found out, for those who didn't know, conducted much of his uh, gynecological experiments on black women who were enslaved and who he administered no anesthesia, although when the procedure was used on white women, he did use anesthesia. So we talked about the, um, hara the, how terrible it was to be able to say that this was a statue to this person. And it goes back about 10 years. It was launched uh, in the community of Harlem by, I want to uh, put onto the record, uh, we want to have Viola Plummer's name entered into the record as a person who began that struggle. So as, has, as we all know, the struggle continued. The statue was removed and placed elsewhere. So it's not in storage, it's not hidden away, it was placed at Greenwood Cemetery. So that's where it is, that's where his grave is. I've heard people say it needs to go in the grave with him, but uh, that's where his statue is. Um, so our concern is that as we move forward in this process, that the community is engaged in a meaningful, impactful, way that's not just um, cosmetic and not just having hearings and committees and uh, participation without having a final say, without having the ability to accept or reject 
what's coming into their community that they are going to be subjected to. I heard an earlier panel, perhaps it was on this panel, uh, talk about the uh, argument over where should it be where a particular statue should be located. We need to make sure that the community is engaged, not just in the process and then at the end, nothing that they have said has been reflected. And I just want to draw a parallel in terms of community involvement and its impact to the fact that there will be a new library, as you well know, at New Lots. And last night was their second community engagement process. And all of their comments will be considered and weighed and incorporated, hopefully, as we then give the plan to the architect. But we have laid out what it is that we want to see in our brand new $31 million library. And the community has already gotten its first report back. Okay, this is what you said at your previous meetings. This is what we are planning to incorporate. And until that kind of respect is given to the community for them to know that they are respected, they are um, admired, and they are valued, then until we have that kind of clear pro process and protocol laid out, we're going to continue to have projects that uh, don't reflect what it is that people want to see in their community. So we've heard the presentation about the artist selection panels and who was on it and who wasn't on it and how the persons that were finalists were in fact, this should have been, okay, this is what is expected of you if you are a finalist so that people would know what to expect and how to participate and how to present themselves. So I just think that it's important that, um, particularly as we're talking now about these statues, how are we going to make sure that the community is involved? What are the next steps? How will they be identified? Uh, how will they be relayed to the public that these are the next steps that are coming? And what is the role that the community will play and have it clearly defined? So I just wanted to get all those points on the record. There are others as well, but those were the main ones. And I want to acknowledge uh, that, that uh, I have had M. Indigo Washington attending those meetings, and she's also here, and I want to thank her for her contributions. Thank you. Um, thank you very I much. Jump in one second. Um, Hold on one second. I just want to say something about Councilmember Barron uh, and thank her uh, uh, for her participation, uh, not just in this hearing, but uh, over decades. And uh, you know how much I respect and value uh, your input and recommendations. And uh, indeed, this hearing has been all about uh, some of the changes that we might be able to implement, particularly, of course, as we go through this transition and have a new commissioner uh, coming, we hope, very soon. Um, we'll see when they appoint. And also about who makes these decisions. Um, that was a big part of the earlier part in particular. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, Raul, did you want to say something? Yes. Um, one of the themes that kept coming up by people advocating for percent for art is like, oh, this controversy is inevitable. And I don't necessarily think so. If we start with a grassroots project going up, you're not going to have the community resistance. And there will be debates. But um, I want to change the template that if we can start from the process going up so that they listen, li listen to the community. The community has a lot of expertise. And I'm, I'm willing to listen to them too, but I, you know, I think the process should start with the grassroots. Uh, I agree. Um, obviously, uh, Kendall uh, has remained with us to uh, uh, listen to uh, all of this feedback, but uh, I do think it's incredibly important for the council to uh, take another look at the program and, and maybe there are some things legislatively that we can do uh, to, uh, to further improve the program. Again, a program that was created in 1982, um, which has done a lot of great things for the city of New York, uh, can't remain static, right? And so we have to change with the city that's changed along with it. Uh, and the expectations, right? I think the expectations of, of community involvement and community decision making has also changed and evolved. And we're at a time of, uh, of us correctly understanding and believing that uh, sorts of projects uh, like these need to be driven by community uh, involvement and input, uh, not from a top-down approach. So with that, I want to thank this panel, all of the members of the panel, um, and thank everyone who testified 
here today. Uh, thank my colleagues, Majority Leader Cumbo and Councilmember Barron, who are with us, Councilmember Borelli, who was with us earlier. Uh, and with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.